morning and welcome to my studio. I'm just getting set to start a new painting and I'm really excited about that because this one's going to be in my typical style, uh, my more traditional work, so it should take a couple days as opposed to a couple weeks. Uh, but as I was getting ready to start today, um, I realized there was an issue with my photograph and I thought this was a perfect opportunity to kind of talk about working from photography, using photographs to paint from. Now, I'm sure many of you have heard from purists who say you should never work from photographs. Um, and uh, I mean, luckily, I've never listened to them because I've built a very successful career doing most of my work in the studio from photographs. But there was a reason why um, that kind of whole kind of statement of not working from photographs had some validity. Um, but it actually has no validity anymore. Um, and so if you want to find out kind of what the reason for not working from photos was and why that no longer applies, stick around. So if you've read anything about art, if you've spent a lot of time like I have uh, reading art magazines, listening to artist videos, just kind of absorbing yourself kind of in the world of art and kind of listening about other people's thoughts and opinions on art, I'm sure you will have heard that kind of that opinion from certain people that you should never work from photographs. Um, and I'm a big believer that never and always have no part in art or any sort of creative endeavor. Um, anytime you tell me you should never do this, I will show you an example of either an artist who does that on a regular basis, whose work just kicks butt, or I'll show you a painting that breaks that rule and kicks butt. Um, and same with if you tell me you should always do this, I'll show you someone who never does it. So that's the first thing I wanna talk about. Like again, there's no such thing as you should always do this or you should never do this. And often it's actually a good idea to do specifically what someone is saying you shouldn't just to see, to try for yourself. But that whole idea of you should never work from photographs, it comes from a very, a very specific reason. And that is that the camera can only expose um, for one kind of set of light inputs, right? So the human eye has the ability to kind of contract and dilate the pupil to regulate how much light is coming in. So that means that we can look at an area that's very bright um, and strongly lit and our pupil can contract and so we can see detail in those lights. And then we can look to the shadows and our pupil will dilate, dilate and it will let in more light and so we can see detail in the shadows, in the midtones, and in the highlights. Now the camera um, basically can expose for only one, one exposure per shot. So if you expose for the mid-tones, then some of your highlights are going to be blown out and some of your shadows are just going to revert to black. If you expose for your highlights, all of your shadows um, will be dark. If you expose for your shadows, all of your highlights will be bright and washed out. And so that was the whole reason for not working from photos because if you just copied the photo, it would be very obvious because all of your shadows would tend toward black all of or if your shadows were very well defined all of your highlights would be washed out um, and so what photography did if you just copied the photos it took away your ability as the artist to choose how much or how little detail you put in the highlights in the shadows and in the midtones you had the ability to see it all but then you were making decisions by working from a photograph, those decisions have been taken away from you. Well, even that kind of whole prohibition didn't even matter anymore fairly long time ago um, because you had the ability to bracket your shots. And what that meant in the old days when we used real film is you would set up an exposure uh, to, to basically the best exposure to capture the midtones, some highlights, some shadows. But then you could shoot a, sh uh, a photo that's overexposed, that shows all the detail in your shadows, but your lights are washed out. And then you could shoot another photo that was underexposed, 
where you had a lot of detail in the highlights, but all of your shadows went black, all of your darks and midtones. And then we had the ability, even going way back, to work from several photos where you have the ability to take in all of the information in the shadows, the midtones, and the highlights, and you make that decision. So that whole argument really hasn't had any validity for a long, long time. But now with digital photography, um, that has made so much easier. Because in the old days, you had to actually have the foresight to actually bracket your shots when you took them. Um, and unless you had the ability of having your own dark room and being able to go in and, and manually in the dark room um, expose for overexposure or underexposure, you were stuck with one photo. But now with digital photography, the camera uh, it takes in so much information. We have the ability now on our computers or even just on our phones to adjust the exposure, to adjust the saturation, to adjust the curves, to adjust so many different things. Um, and so now we have the ability just on taking one shot to make several different versions of that photo that show us more information in the shadows, another one that shows us more information in the highlights, another one that's just generally exposed well for all of the midtones. And then we have the ability to work from several of those photos to, to make the decisions on our own about how much detail or how light or how dark the shadows are going to be or the highlights or midtones are going to be. So the reason that I kind of thought about, about doing the video on this today was the photo that I'm going to work from. So this is the photo that I'm going to work from and I'll actually put it, um, a, a version of it up on the screen. So it's a really nice composition and it's very abstracted, which is something I'm really excited about kind of going to after working on that very meticulous stained glass piece. But the problem is it's, it's kind of exposed well for the top part of the image where the light is kind of, it's soft light is kind of filtering through the trees. But that area of the pond and the reflection is extremely underexposed and is very dark, almost black. Um, and so then, you know, you have the, you make the decision, oh, I don't want to work from this. Well, it's like, no, I do want to work from this photo. Um, and I do want to create a painting from this, but the, the solution to the problem is extremely, extremely easy. I just go back onto my computer, pull up that photo, um, and just increase the exposure, play around with the curves. Um, until I'm happy with the exposure and the information that are showing up in the bottom half and the reflections. Um, and then when I go to do the painting, I will refer more to the first one when I'm working in the upper half. And I will refer more to the second one when I'm working in the reflections. Um, and then at a certain point, I won't even be looking at the photos. I'll be just working on the composition of the painting but I have the availability of the information. If I want more information of, of the shadows uh, and to see more color and more subtle differences, I'll go to the one that's slightly overexposed. Um, now, I used to use this to great effect uh, back when I was doing portraits uh, because portraiture is, is something where there's a lot of real subtle things um, that may or may not be captured in any given photo. So, and I'll try and I'm going to see if I can dig up a, uh, a photo that I worked from uh, to create a painting. If I can't, I'll just take a photo of, of someone, probably one of my sons, and use it as an example. But when I used to do uh, portrait commissions, I used to work from maybe five different photos, uh, five different versions of the same photo. So I would have, first of all, a, a photo that was that was the exposure was a good overall exposure and the color tones were natural. Um, and so that was my kind of basic kind of, um, generally this was kind of what the, the values and colors were going to look like in the finished photo. But then I would have one that was overexposed where I had a lot of detail in the shadows, um, but no detail in the highlights, they'd all be blown out. But I'd have another one that was underexposed where I would have no detail in the shadows, but there would be a lot of detail in the highlights. And then I would also just have a grayscale photo that was just black and white that would give me values. So just, just judging lights and darks. 
And then I would have one more photo where I would just really push the saturation to the point that it was garish. Um, but what that allowed me to do was to see what was the color dominance in any sort of neutral color passage. So when you look at um, images of our face, if you just look at someone in natural light in life or in photographs, there are a lot of areas, especially in the shadows, that are a neutral, um, that are approaching gray. Um, but the question is, is that a greenish gray? Is that a reddish gray? Is it a bluish gray? Is it an orangey gray? And often you really can't tell from the photo. But by pushing that color saturation, it makes it abundantly clear which color that gray is tending towards. Now, when you go to paint the actual portrait, you don't paint it the way it appears in that image where the color saturation is really pushed. But if you have a variety of neutrals mixed on your palette, but you have one that's more orange, one that's more red, one that's more violet, kind of all the way around the color wheel, when it comes to painting that particular area of the face, then I would look to that that kind of oversaturated image to decide which of my neutrals I was going to be dipping my brush into. Um, and I found that incredibly helpful to produce paintings that were very, very natural looking, but had a lot of color in them. Um, and I've just taken that to the same thing using my using the same sort of deal when I do my landscapes, although for the most part, um, I don't work from several images because I've painted enough landscapes um, and I don't need that very specific information um, to have to work from several images um, just for a landscape. But in this particular case of this uh, photo, I think I do. But if you're working on things where there's a lot of subtleties and for example, in a portrait where it has to look exactly like that person and you need to nail it, then that whole idea of working from a variety of versions of the same image can be really, really helpful. So again, that uh, getting back to my initial premise, always and never, I believe has no place in the conversation about creativity and creating art. I personally discount anything anyone has to say when they say you should always do this or you should never do that because all they're showing is their, the limitations of their own knowledge. Um, but in particular for photography, uh, my opinion is there's nothing, nothing wrong with working from photographs. Just be aware of the limitations and be aware of the things that you can do to go beyond those limitations so that the camera is not making the decisions you are making the decisions from the information that the camera is giving you. So I hope you found that helpful. Um, now I'm going to get on to this painting and that will be tomorrow's vlog. So I thank you for your time. I hope you found this helpful and informative. If you have, give me a thumbs up. I welcome your comments and questions. If you haven't already, please subscribe. Please spread the word to your other artist friends. And lastly, as always, I thank you for your time. I'm Tim Packard.